Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. This is Lisa Hayes and Kathy Park with Love, Life, and Law of Attraction. And today we are going to talk about one of my favorite topics. I'm going to capitalize this whole hour with one of the things that I love to talk about the most. <laughs> so our subject today is what I call the relationship contract. Um, and I, I think that this is such a powerful tool for transformation in relationships that I just, yeah, I'm pretty excited. How are you today, Cassie, while I'm just rambling on about how thrilled I am to talk about the relationship contract? <laughs> I'm fabulous. I'm excited to hear about it. I, um, you know, I, I know that you implement this in your life. I don't hear a lot of people in the relationship coaching community talking about it. And I think it, it's important for um, it's important for someone getting married. It's probably important for someone who is married. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. And I will say before we even get started, I mean, I will use the word marriage a lot, and I don't necessarily mean that literally. I mean, what we're talking about is any kind of relationship you think you want to do for the long haul, that you want to be in for a lifetime. I was even considering prior to the call if this would necessarily have to be about romantic partnerships because I really think Mm. that this might be a process that I could go through with my children because it's very flexible in terms of, of the approach because you really kind of write your own script here. But basically... I mean, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. And I said this in the promo for the show, and I've said this out loud, and a lot of people kind of roll their eyes at me, but I truly do believe that a lot of couples spend more time actually and energy, like the amount of energy that goes into planning, but more time and energy planning a wedding than they actually spend planning how they're going to do their marriage. I would agree with that. Because it's a and it's um, it's something you have to be more diligent about, extra conscious about, because it naturally happens. You know, like um, mm-hmm. once you start to once you set a wedding date, all of this stuff naturally goes in motion and comes up. But no, there's no there's no no natural stuff that comes up for how are we other than like some basic questions if you haven't moved in together you know, where you're going to live, things like that. There's not a whole process that comes across that asks you to define how you are going to live together and how you want your life to go as a married couple. And what you expect from each other and what you want and expect from yourself. I mean, there are a lot of complex questions that go into figuring out how to coexist in the world. And I think that you know, it's easy in the beginning because your relationship is where it's at. I mean, you may still be in the honeymoon phase to some degree. I mean, it's easy to think that everything stays the same, but everything Mm -hmm. doesn't stay the same. I mean, eventually the new car smell wears off and (laughs) life happens and the new car smell is replaced with dirty diaper smell. And, I mean, we don't really sit down and actually talk about how we're going to do relationship. I know that, I mean, I'm on my second marriage, and in my practice marriage, marriage number one, (laughs) we never talked about it. I mean, even when our relationship was failing, I mean, at that point it was probably way too late. But we never, in seven years of marriage, sat down and talked about how we wanted to be married. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm a relationship coach. I just said that out loud, but it's true. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, those were in your learning days. You're learning to be a relationship coach days. <laughs> but I mean, how many people? <laughs> how many people can say that they've done that? I think that's a very small percentage of the population that can say they've actually sat down and and talked about how they want their marriage to look. Not not we're not talking about where you want to live, how many kids you want to have, who you're going to spend the holidays with. We're talking about how your interactions and your exchanges happen, how, like you said, who, what are your expectations of yourself and of each other in your relationship? 
And I think some of these topics are hard to talk about. I mean, there are there are some things that are innately socially difficult to talk about, and yet those things are pivotal in a marriage. I mean, I think the two things that create the most difficulty in marriages long term are sex and money. And Mm -hmm. I think those are the two things that are most difficult socially, just in general, to talk about for everybody, sex and money. People aren't good at talking about those things. Right, right. They're not. And it's not the the type of thing where, um, for lack of a better word, programmed to sort of have that conversation always, or even we're not, maybe don't even necessarily get all the tools we need to even have really good conversations about it. It's it, Those are areas that take a little bit of self-exploration, um, probably to come to the table with the best information when you're going to do something like a relationship conversation around sex and money. Mm-hmm. So I mean, let's talk for just briefly what the relationship contract is, because it is just that. It's a contract. And oftentimes when uh, when I say contract, particularly women kind of bristle and roll their eyes because they think it takes the, you know, the romance and the spontaneity out of a relationship, but it really doesn't. Like it frees up a lot of space in a relationship for romance and spontaneity. But you are you are literally looking at this like a written document that you're going to sign and it becomes contra- a contractual framework for a relationship. And I think where it becomes very fluid and personal is you agree on a set of subjects that you're going to manage in your contract. So not one set of subjects is going to work for all couples, but there are a handful of what I would call core contractual subjects. So sex and money are first, those Mm -hmm. are separate. Sex, money, communication, conflict resolution, finances and career, which are very often separate. Those may not be the same thing. Parenting, that might include, you know, pets and what have you, but some form of parenting if it's happening. Um, Family, like extended family, how we show up in our family, how we show up in our career as a family. Um, And then I would also put in their personal development or spiritual growth. And I would probably also add long-term goals, like, you know, one-year, five-year goals. Because I think very often couples aren't on the same page there, and they think they are. Can you think of any other areas that you might add in a contract? Um, Like household duties? Is that something you would put in a contract? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. (laughs) I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a, that that's one that really gets there's a lot of assumptions that go on and um, that even like the I, I think it might go in their household duties or it sort of might go about how we um, you know a friend of mine he uses the word like protect the energy of our home meaning like what are we what are what are they doing um, in his case specifically like him doing to protect what what comes into the home that might not be healthy, whether it's people, right. you know, things like that. And, he, and I, when I heard that, I was like, that's really, that's really good. Um, and then, you know, just like, I'm, I don't know what the word for it, but sort of how are we, how are we going to keep our home? Like, uh, you know, what's the level of comfort with, you know, sort of how everyone needs their space to be, which I think is different than housework. So I would I might actually make a note for myself. <laughs> so I mean it's interesting to see even in this conversation how the the subjects there are gonna be those core subjects, but well there are going to be unique subjects that they agree on in advance that mm-hmm. apply specifically to them. Obviously parenting's not going to apply for you know, to everybody. And for some people, communication and conflict management might be one subject or, you know, finances and career might be one subject. In my home, they're not. They're separate. But the very first step you do is look at, a, you know, look at what your core subjects are going to be, what things you want to add, 
and agree on a list of things that you want to include in your contract. And I would say the ones that are non-negotiable might be, you know, sex, money, communication, and I like household duties because you're right, that should be on the list of non-negotiable things that need to be, you know, discussed. But I, it's, it is very individual. This is where you kind of put your unique couple stamp on the contract. Um, and then the next thing you do might be the most interesting part of the work because everybody has baggage. I mean, we've all got mm-hmm. triggers. We've all got stuff in our stuff in our past. And I mean, I've had people say to me, this is my first, you know, significant relationship. The lucky ones who meet the first one right away. I don't have a lot of baggage and stuff in my past. But you do because it's not your first relationship. I mean, we all have relationships with our parents and our siblings and previous friends. I mean, we've all got stuff. And we tend to look at baggage, quote, unquote, as a bad thing. But I don't necessarily think baggage is a bad thing at all. I mean, when we're willing to take it out and look at it and use it as a tool for setting boundaries and framework, that baggage actually becomes very useful. But a lot of times people don't take the time to do that. Do you? Do you agree with that? I do agree with that because it's so much easier when you look at, um, you know, you look at the baggage pieces and you, like, to understand someone, like, you know, if someone, whatever, you know, first thing coming to mind is, like, they don't, I mean, this is one thing I know that's different in different households, put stuff in the sink versus put stuff in the dishwasher right away, Right. So, like, if you understand either where that comes from or that need for that or, you know, Mm -hmm. it makes it a lot easier to do because it's not just an irritating thing. Right. The information matters. So Mm -hmm. what I say is pick your first category, one category at a time, and really go back and look at your life through the lens of that category. So, like you said, housework, why it matters. Um, For me, the one that always comes to mind is communication, but particularly conflict resolution. Like, I've been in some pretty challenging relationships that got really hairy, and so I find it very difficult to be yelled at. And, I, in fact, you don't yell at me. Like, the minute you start raising your voice at me, I either shut down or I lash out. But either way... It's ended. It's over. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I have to really understand myself well enough to be able to say if we're going to have effective communication, you can't raise your voice at me and explain why. Like the understanding the why makes it much more easy to accommodate that. Right. And I think this part of the process can take some time. It's, you know, it's not something you're going to rush through because you really do want to unpack all the bags. Start with your childhood. Look at your family of origin. Look at your relationship with your friends. Look at past relations, past, you know, romantic relationships that you've had that may help you set up boundaries so the relationship works very well for you. Finished with that, you go back to the table and you share information about that one particular subject. And I highly recommend taking this one subject at a time. Some will be easy, some will not be so smooth. But one subject at a time, and you share your information. And you have to be willing to not just share, but hear, like really seek to understand why somebody might request a certain framework or boundary in a relationship. And again, when the information about the why is on the table, that is easier. But mm-hmm. only from that point, then you can start to negotiate quite literally what the framework for your relation around your relationship around that one particular thing might be. So I like that. I mean, I like the whole process because you're you're bringing all of the information to the table, so everybody's putting all of their information on the table to be seen, which I think is important, Mm -hmm. number one. Because, um, you know, we've said it like three times, but it's really important. Like knowing the why is important. So allowing that stuff to be seen is really important. And And then you start the negotiation process. Like 
from a place of really informed, of, of being really informed. And you set up a framework for communication that works really effectively. I mean, we had a situation in our house last night um, where something went down. Something went down <laughs> regarding the dentist, of all things, the dentist. And <laughs> my beloved was upset by it. Like it, it, And he doesn't get upset very often. I mean, it's pretty rare. But he was upset about this thing having to do with the dentist. And he was clearly upset. I mean, he certainly didn't raise his voice, but I could tell. Like, there was a certain amount of what I would consider stomping around, which is an exaggeration. But it felt (laughs) like that to me. And I felt myself starting to get really uncomfortable with that, like super uncomfortable. But it gives us a framework for discussion that sounds a little bit like something out of, you know, a, a weird movie. Like, I can sit down with him and say... This triggers me because, you know, when you behave mm-hmm. this way, it triggers me because. So then this happens. I mean, it, it's a framework of dialogue that really allows me to own my own stuff mm-hmm. in time, request a different behavior, rather than, oh, my God, you're being an asshole about the dentist. Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> right. It's kind of how I felt. But we have a vocabulary that works within our relationship because of the work that we've done around the contract. Very cool. So did you, I mean, did you always know you were going to do this contract? Like, did you learn it from someone? Like, how did you, going into a relationship with David, like, at what point, I mean, is this something that, like, should you always have a marriage contract? Do you think people in relate just a relationship, you know, once you get to a certain point, should there be a contract? And how do you, if you're someone listening to this call and you want your partner involved, how do you bring that up? Um, well, the way it originated with the two of us is we had both been married before. And, mm-hmm. I mean, there were good and bad good and bad parts in both of those marriages. But, I mean, we were both aware that we had made mistakes in some of our previous relationships and had a much clearer vision of what we actually wanted. And we were driving one day. We had taken a drive to the beach in the car and started talking about some of this stuff just in conversation, and I started making notes and, you know, asking questions and making notes and asking questions. By the end of that drive, I had what looked like, accidentally, a contract, you know, a Mm. little agreement. Yes. And I really started looking at that and, you know, and and sort of started implementing it with clients and to do the same sort of self-exploration process. And seeing the results of that was pretty powerful. It was powerful in our relationship. I think you know, there is a time and a place for it. And I think the time and the place is when you have agreed that you're in the relationship for the long haul. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to that, it might not be appropriate. But if you're thinking about cohabitating, you know, if you're talking engagement, (laughs) or if you are married, and I think that may be one of the trickiest places is when you're already in relationship, how do you bring up the conversation and go back and you know, sort of lay down this foundation where the relationship's already built. But what I have found particularly is men like this process, go figure. It's concrete. Right. It's like it's black yeah. and white, and that's the way men think. Nine times out of ten, men feel like they're wandering in the dark with relationships anyway. They sort of feel like they're kind of lost in the mist. Like, men are very likely to agree to and enjoy this process because it gives them something black and white to work with. So I don't think it's that hard to bring up. Like, this is something I ran across. I think it might be really useful to us. How do you feel about this? I've yet to run across a man who was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) They're, They're usually all in on a contract which is very different than being all in on some sort of a marriage therapy relationship wandering session. It's it's different. Right. 
Right. That totally makes sense to me because you're right. You know, men, you know, they like those concrete things, the things that they know what to do. So give us, can you give an example of what my, what my, something or one part of the relationship contract to look like or okay so let's talk about I mean let's talk about I'm trying to think of one section I mean let's talk about communication like in our agreement we do communicate we have agreed that we will not raise voices with each other Mm -hmm. that we will allow the space to communicate what we're angry or frustrated about, but we do not try and problem solve when we're angry. We have agreed to an open communication approach in terms of electronic communication. Like mm-hmm. my email is open to him, his email is open to me. You know, text messages aren't private, not that we ever really either of us take advantage of that, but it is an agreement because of some past stuff. We have agreed, and this is one we're a little loose around the edges on, but we have agreed that we will take a defrag space at the end of the day, you Mm -hmm. know, five or ten minutes, so that we're talking about work, and then we let that go so that we can be present with each other in the evening. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we have agreed that we will take at least a couple of hours during the week that we just spend together in some form of, you know, just being together in communication. So, you know, that's some a walk, you know, go someplace quiet and sit underneath the tree or turn the TV off for a couple of hours in the evening and just spend time together so that we feel connected through our communication. And mm-hmm. when we agreed on all of those things, those things literally go in writing and we are very good at holding each other to them. And it's not just me. Like, David is just as likely to say, yep, that's not what we agreed to. <laughs> that's not really it. <laughs> you know, we have a category around romance, actually, which is also secondary. Like, we agreed that we will try to get away for a weekend at least quarterly that we will do date nights, that we will have a certain amount of non-physical or non-sexual physical touch, that we hold hands when we're, when we're close enough to do that. We do that regularly. And we write all of that stuff down and commit to it. And these agreements don't have to be elaborate. I mean, I think our parenting agreement is pretty loose around the edges. Like, it's fairly short, but for some couples, that's going to be a longer category. But right. basically, you know, it doesn't have to be a big deal as long as it's a, a commu- like a community agreement. Both partners mm-hmm. are on board with something they feel is sustainable. And then I think the next part about the process that might be even more important is we agree to review it and update it. Like, we literally do sit down now annually. We break out the contract and we grade each other how we're doing so we know where we're at. We're not assuming that it's going well when it's not. And then update the contract if if it's necessary. Because you and I talk a lot about this. It's really important to stay current. Right. How often do you think that would be necessary? I think I think once a year is good, and it seems to be working. I'm wondering, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think once a year is good, but it, sometimes it feels like it feels far away, like a lot can happen in a year. So I might even say like a six-month, and maybe it's not like a full review. Maybe it's like a, a grade and a, um, you know, kind of like, Let's grade each other and see where we can get better, or what's you know what do we need to focus on? I tend to agree, I and mean, I I tend to say once a year if you've been together for a while, every six months if you're brand new. But if there's a major life event, it probably mm. needs to be sooner. Like if you have right. if you do your review in you know January and in April you mm-hmm. have a baby, everything should change. 
So you probably okay. need to update sooner than later. And if you find one category where you're where you know you're failing, and we've done that, like we used to have some pretty high expectations around romance, <laughs> but we weren't we weren't hitting the mark in terms of commitments that we'd made. I mean, uh-huh. knowing that we maybe shot a little bit too high, that might prompt an earlier mini review. That makes sense. Do you ever find the review process hard? Like, I mean, and you guys have, you've, did, you've done this from the beginning, so, and this is more of a, I don't know, just a curiosity question, but do you find with your clients that the review process is hard or does it, because it's in writing, like re- really become easy? They're going to bark. No, I'm going to kick them. Um, I think the review process is hard isn't a word I would use. I mean, it, it is energy intensive. Mm. And I think, I mean, it causes you to come face to face with yourself. If you're going to get a grade on anything, it it causes you to come face to face with yourself. I think as couples really work this process, the first one might be more challenging, but something mm-hmm. about knowing that the review is coming keeps you accountable to the commitments that you've made, okay. and it gets easier and easier. I mean, I will be totally honest. I've heard things in our annual review that I didn't want to hear. <laughs> but, you know, better to hear it so I can course correct than, not, you know, never hear it at all. I I don't think it's hard. And I think the review process actually, you know, the vast majority of the time actually makes a couple much, much stronger moving into the next year than they were before. I mean, it's a little bit like recommitting to your relationship every year. You're kind of getting married over and over again when Mm -hmm. you're looking at it contractually. Right. Which makes a lot of sense. And you're right, like easier to hear in a review than to hear five or ten years down the road when someone hasn't been happy for a long time or doesn't feel like, you know, commitments are getting met and it leads to not being in a relationship anymore. Well, I mean, which is exactly, by the way, what happened to me in my first marriage. I mean, I've blogged about this, I've written about it, but I remember with, like, precise accuracy, like, down (laughs) to the detail the day that my ex-husband sat me down with a list of 11 things that he didn't like. I mean, and that was years down the road and one child in the mix. I mean, those are the kinds of things that should have been addressed much, much sooner. I mean, optimally, they should be addressed in the moment, but they should have been addressed many times prior to that moment on the beach. Because at that moment on the beach, it was too late. We we went right. too far down that road into resentment and disappointment. I didn't know it at the time, but it wasn't fixable. It it had gone too long. Mm. That makes sense. And I also think that doing it in this format makes does train you to negotiate. Like rather than getting very hard fixed on a point. We learn how to talk about ways that we can both get what we want. And, mm-hmm. again, those tools of communication become very valuable. Right. It makes sense. And it kind of gives a baseline to go back back to when something isn't working. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is, that is kind of it in a nutshell. And can you think of any other points or questions on this one? Um, just um, in the beginning, like how does a couple know, do you just kind of automatically know if a topic is you need to address it? Or like you said, all couples are different. Is it sort of like intuitive, you know, or is it something that you kind of, you know, say go through them all and then see which ones you don't really need? I would say go through them all, take out the ones that you don't need, and then look at the biggest problem area you've got in your relationship. And very often couples will see that differently. 
Mm-hmm. And the sort of stereotypical thing that happens is you'll get a man who says who says the biggest problem area in their relationship is sex, and the woman in the same couple says the biggest problem area in their relationship is romance. I mean, but you know, you look at what you think the biggest challenges are, and make sure they're covered by one of the one of the subjects that you've chosen. So that neither person's stuff is getting ignored while somebody's stuff is getting addressed. Um, and that doesn't, and I just, just for the record, I think when you're doing this, it makes a lot of sense once you get your topics agreed on to pick two or three that are going to be easier. Don't start with mm-hmm. the hard stuff straight away. Like that might, it might be worth it to build some skills and kind of, learn how to have these conversations before you take the big hairy subjects on but at least making sure they're on the list kind of helps everybody know that you know that you are going to get your day so to speak and I also think like I said one subject at a time is helpful Mm -hmm. and really planning on giving this process a little bit of time I mean maybe one subject a week is enough where you decide on the subject, you spend your time during the week doing your self exploration, and at some point on the weekend, you do your negotiation and you do your contract. Um, but yeah, I mean, give it time, but keep moving forward. I like that. I think we've covered it. Where can um, people find you if they have questions about it? LisaMHaze.com, and where can people find you if they have questions about anything else? CassieParks.com. We're so easy to find. <laughs> we are. <laughs> no great mystery here. LisaMHaze.com and CassieParks.com. So, yeah. Thank you very much for listening today, everybody, and thank you, Cassie, for talking to me about one of my favorite things. Definitely. Thanks for uh, bringing it up. I love this subject. I think it's key to creating good, long-standing relationships. I really do think I may try this on on one of my kids. I might call my oldest and say, hey, we're going to do a relationship contract. I bet he rolls his eyes and grits his teeth, but I bet he does it. <laughs> I bet so, too. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear about that. We'll like check in in a couple months about it. Catch you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye.